believe together as those who confess faith in Jesus Christ. And just a reminder to you that though we embrace these doctrines that I've been sharing with you as Southern Baptists, you need to also understand that many other denominational groups embrace these same doctrines. We're not just the only ones. Don't think when you get to heaven just going to be Southern Baptists there. Now, I recognize the fact that there are many groups out there today uh, that are turning their back on some of these key doctrines that we'll be studying. But you just need to understand we are not the only ones. There are other brothers and sisters out there who do love the Lord Jesus Christ who are committed to His truth. But I say to you, as your pastor and one who is supposed to guard you, that you also have to be careful. Uh, because just as we spoke last week, when you actually say uh, and talk about God, other people may be thinking something very different than what you and I are thinking. Because there's many ideologies out there today. There's many religions. We talked about them last week and the way that uh, uh, some of them are just totally out in left field. We know many of them are actually false religions. There's cults and other ideologies. So again, I challenge you as you serve the Lord and as you go about your day-to-day -day activities and functioning that you think about the truth that when we speak about God, we have to clarify that we are speaking of the God of the Bible. We are speaking about the one true living God, the Creator God. Now again, that is going to put you in contrast with the world because the world doesn't want to believe that God is the Creator God, although there are some uh, denominations and Christians today that think that they found the solution to that, which is the, uh, this idea of theistic evolution. All i got to say to you is that's a lie. It's not supported in any way by the Scriptures. In fact, I just want to remind you that in your science classes that you studied in, in elementary school and in middle school and in high school and in college, no one ever was able to provide for you a single, a single form that was in a meteor. just want to remind you that uh, the, many of these images that are still in their textbooks we discovered one of the men that was created that was supposed to be an intermediary form turned out to be a pig's tooth. Nobody's bothered to correct that. Nobody's bothered to take that out of our textbooks. And so our teachers, without perhaps even knowing it, are teaching things that aren't true. Not their fault. Not to blame them. But the reality is, beloved, we've been taught so many lies. And so as we confront our world and as we face these things, the only way that we can do that in a way that's going to provide foundational truths and the only way that can provide the things that our children and our grandchildren need to be able to live the life that God wants them to live, the only way to keep them from being deceived by the lies is for us to consistently and to faithfully bring to them the truth. In fact, one of the marvelous and wonderful things, and I hope you kind of got this in our studies of the Scriptures, is that true science, in every aspect of it, always seems to support the Scriptures. And that makes sense. Do you know why? Because who's the author of the book? God. It's God. Who's the creator of the world? God. It's God. Who put all these things into place and ordered them and set them forth? God. So it would make sense that when God puts something in place that what we discover in real science, not pretend in pseudoscience, that it supports the Holy Scriptures. Not to mention all the archaeological evidence and so many other things, beloved, that provides those truths to us. And yet, and yet, as we embrace the truth of God's holy word, as we believe the God of the Bible, we find ourselves as true Bible-believing Christians in constant confrontation today with the world around us. And how can that be? If truth is truth, how is it that we can be in such conflict with the world? Well, beloved, I share with you today the reason that we can be in such conflict with the world is because the world has uh, dethroned God and embraced Satan. Amen. You say, what, Pastor Ken? <laughs> yes, they don't even know that they've done that. But that's exactly what we've done. And remember what Jesus tells us about Satan. He's a liar. In fact, Jesus said he's the father of lies. And again, I say to you this morning, beloved, the only thing that will keep your mind clearly thinking, the only thing that will help to direct your thoughts and your actions, your choices and your decisions in a way that is good and right and true is going to be for you to embrace, to study, and to know the truth 
of God's holy word. And so we face a world that is hostile. But you know what else that concerns me today? We actually face, and I don't know any other way to say it, but a church, and it's not the true church. But we face many pseudo-churches, or even churches that were true, that are abandoning those truths today. And the world loves them. And the world embraces them. And the world sees them and believes them as being normative. And so if it sees them and believes them as normative, guess what? For those of us who believe the Bible and who believe the God of the Bible, we become radical. We become hostile. We become out of the norm. And so as I have been trying to help you to understand, when you answer the question that I'm asking of us every week and multiple times, do you believe the Bible and the God of the Bible? If you answer that in the affirmative, you must understand, beloved, that the false church who has a foothold is going to be hostile to you. For they live in a charade. They are apostate. They are not adhering to the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Anyone that says to you that the Bible or that the gospel or that Jesus or that God is something less than what we know that they are, then, beloved, don't have anything to do with anything from those people. Reject all of what they are, because if you don't, you'll be like the animal that is lured to the trap by the scent of something that you like. And you know what happens when the animal gets in the trap, don't you? And the door closes. There is no escape. Well, beloved, in spite of these things, we have come to understand that God's Word is true. That it's reliable. I've given you many, many different aspects of science, of philosophy, of ideology that support it, of archaeology, of even the text and its transmission itself. And last week we began to talk about the true and the living God Listen to me, the one true and living God, there is no other. And what does that mean? That means that the Bible tells us that all the gods of the people are idols. How do you think that's going to sit with a Buddhist or a Muslim? How do you think that's going to sit with a Hindu or an American Indian? They're not going to be happy about that. Because it stands in direct contrast to the multiplicity of gods that they want to believe in, or in the case of uh, the Muslims, the one God that they want to believe in, which really is the God of themselves and their own destiny. You put yourself in conflict with them. And yet even in that, they would argue with you that you are living a lie. Because did we not see last Sunday that the God of the Bible who expresses himself and gives his name as what? Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, those four Hebrew letters, that's singular, but yet in the same verse there in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the Lord, Yahweh, the single individual God is the Elohim, which we learned is the plural form of the word God. So a Muslim would tell you that you're believing a lie because God is in one. And yet, beloved, the scriptures make it very clear, Old and New Testament, that God is one, but that he does manifest himself in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We see in the creation of the world. We see God creating the world. We learn later in first, I mean, in John chapter 1 and in Colossians and Hebrews that the person through whom the creating part was done is actually who? Jesus Christ. So God is the one that had the plan and the idea. He affected the plan through his son. And then what do we see? The spirit of God hovering over the surface of the deep. 
So we have all three persons of the Godhead, all in unity, all focused on the same thing, all pursuing the same goal, the same end objective. It's in the New Testament also. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? We looked at that last week, didn't we? And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. Who's talking if it's a son? The Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And, we, and the Spirit of God, the Scripture says, came down as if the form of a dove on Him. So we have it there again. All three persons of the Godhead, all functioning in unity, all in agreement, all delighted together, and yet in one. You know what is so cool? If we follow God's plan and purpose, and we will take the time to seek His face, and to find that proper mate for ourselves, God, in the marriage relationship of a man and a woman, can provide a unity, an intimacy, a connection of heart and mind over the period of a lifetime that provides for them a sense of the essence of the uniqueness of being two individuals, but the wonder of how they have begun to think alike, act alike, feel alike, believe alike, and walk and work together alike. And so God gives us that ability to know the essence of His character and His being through that incredibly wondrous relationship. Tragically, there's very few today that perhaps ever get there. And even if they may have chosen incorrectly, I believe the Bible speaks to us the truth that if we will humble ourselves and be who He wants us to be, that even in that incorrect action, Romans can be proven true, that he will work out all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so we saw last week that God is sovereign. He's the one that sets all things forth. He's the one for, through whom the plan of the ages and of the world was set forth. And last week, beloved, we answered the questions that the world is constantly asking and seeking answers for. Is there a God, the world is saying? And actually, you know what? In the media and the liberal world today, they don't even want that question asked anymore. Because even if, even if it's asked, it causes you to think about the reality that there might be a God. And they don't want you to think that. And yet the world and the depths of our being and every culture we have ever seen is asking the question, is there a God? And guess what? We have the answer. Yes! <laughs> yes, there is a God. There's a one true living God, the God of the Bible, the God who called Israel to himself before they were a people so that they would not boast about anything but him. And he called them to himself to show the world who he is. And who is God? How does God speak of himself? We looked last week. He's the architect of the universe, the creator of the world of all things. And that's a tough sell, again, to a world that is bought into the lie of evolution and who are so steeped in that lie that it takes massive amounts of truth, massive amounts of evidences that we have in science, by the way, but have not been presented to the people at large. But it takes tremendous amount of effort on our part to educate or re-educate them so that they can begin to see that truth. But it's worth the time and investment because their eternal destiny is at stake. And so as Christians, we have to maybe be a little sharper than others. We might need to go back to school a little bit in our sermons and go back to school on the internet and learn some of these things so that we can speak intelligently and coherently about these truths with one end and one purpose in mind, not to beat a person in an argument, not to win some debate or battle, but to help people to have insight sufficient that the Spirit of God can bring conviction that the truth is being spoken. And that will lead to confession of faith in Christ. Can I know God, the world says? What did we say last week? Yes, you can. You can know God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is a personal and a relational God. Does He care about my life? Doesn't John 3.16 speak that truth? Yes, for God so loved. He does love us. He does care about us, beloved. Is there any future? Indeed, there is. Suicide is massively rampant in our culture today. And it's because people have no hope. Amen. But we have hope. Amen. We 
We have a hope and a truth that provides foundation for that hope so that it's not just nebulous. There are some places that we can get our uh, hands on. It's like maybe climbing a, a wall, but there's places we can get a foothold and a handhold. And though we can't see everything and know everything, there's enough evidence, as beloved, that we can know and we can have that hope. And that hope comes to us through the triune God. So today and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to flesh out this whole idea of God. You know, there in your Baptist face of message, and again, I'm challenging you to bring it with you every week. There's still some up here on the pews, some in the back. Uh, we handed them out the first time. You need to get a hold of one or go out there on the internet and look up SBC, uh, Baptist faith of message. What's so cool about the one on the internet is when you hover over these scriptures, they pop right up. And you can read the scriptures that are supporting the things that we believe. Woo! Yeah, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> and so we looked at God last week on page 7. But what I want you to do today is begin to think about the fact that God does manifest himself as a triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see that on pages 8 and 9 of your Baptist faith and message. You see that on the pages of scripture as we've already attested to this morning. And so let's see what we believe. God, as Father, reigns with providential care over His universe, over His creatures, and the flow and the stream of human history according to the purpose, purposes of His grace. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. By the way, we dealt with all three of those. You know those fancy words. Remember those fancy words? He's, what is it? What is all-powerful? Omnipotent. All-knowing. Omniscient. All loving. Well, we didn't do that one, did we? We should have done that one. We did he's everywhere, he's omnipresent, and we did he's eternal. But I like the all loving because we know from 1 John, what is 1 John? God is love. No, 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 no. Love is God, the very essence, the nature of his being. So that's the way the Greek has it. God, not God is love, but love God is. So the essence of who he is is love. So I love that there. And he's all wise. God is Father in truth to those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is fatherly in his attitude toward all men. And then you see a multiplicity of scriptures there, beloved, that help to give us the most important basis for our faith, and that is God's holy word. So today I would like for us to turn, beloved, and I would like to, to consider there in the book of Ephesians this morning, there in chapter 1, that God is our Father. And that God reflects and reveals Himself as Father. And in this passage this morning here in Ephesians chapter 1, beloved, we are going to see that God does reign. He does reign, that He does care, that He has an eternal purpose and plan. That God is Father to all who call on Him through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, put my little phone up here today to try to be a little more efficient with you guys. And I see that it's already 1132. That's okay. So worship is over. Yeah, it's, it's over. I just want you to be aware of that. Um, so that you'll know, I need, I don't know if you listen to much of the Bible teaching and all out there on the internet, but most of the preachers that are preaching the Bible, uh, they take a little bit of time, and we're going to take a little bit more time today, but it's very obvious to me, given the fact that it's uh, 1132, we'll never get through all four of these points today. So guess what you got to do? Read the Bible. you got to come Bible. back next week. Yeah, you got to read the Bible. <laughs> you got to come back next week, because we will at least get through, I hope, this first point, because I can't just leave you hanging with all of these things we've just put up. Well, beloved, let's look at this passage here in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. And let's read this chapter together this morning. We're really going to only focus on some key verses, but I think that you need to get the whole context of it, because I'll refer to some other verses throughout it. Now, there's one other thing that I want to say about reading this passage here in the book of Ephesians. People tell me all the time that the Bible is hard to understand. And in some cases, I believe that they are correct. But let me just say also that I believe it's worth the effort to understand it. And so one of the things that I want you to look at today, there's a lot of personal pronouns going to be thrown out here today. And as we go through the message, I'm going to try to help you to keep straight who's, God's, who's God and who's Jesus in these references. And if you read it slowly enough and carefully enough, you'll be able to tell that. But I highlighted it in my text so that, you know, yellow is uh, uh, God and pink is Jesus because of the blood, you know, that kind of thing. But it's helpful to maybe sometimes to understand you've got to stop, go back into Scriptures and read it a little more carefully. So look here this with me this morning, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, 
an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us, that's God, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, that's how we know the other He was God, to Himself, that's God, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His, God's grace, which He, God, freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, that's Jesus. In Him, that's Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, Jesus, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, that's God's grace and Christ's grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him. Most of that was about God Himself. He, God, made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed to us. In him, that's Jesus, in Jesus, the kind intention came from God through Jesus, with a view to an administration suitable to the fulfillment, fulfillment of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. And in him also we have obtained an inheritance, that's Jesus, that him there, having been predestined according to his purpose, that's God's purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, that's God's will, to the end that we who are uh, we who uh, were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise both to him as there are Jesus, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. By the way, you see there the Holy Spirit in verse 13. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he, God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead and seated him, Jesus, at his God's right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule, far above authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ones to come. And he, God, put all things in subjection under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his, Jesus' body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Well, beloved, my goodness, pretty powerful, isn't it? Amazing what content is there. Do you understand this morning? We could probably spend a lifetime right there and never figure it out all of what we need to understand. But what I want you to understand this morning, beloved, is right here at the beginning of this passage. I want you to understand that God the Father reigns. What does it say? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ. In these first three verses, beloved, culminating there with verse 3, we see that God is the one that is acting. And that is because God is sovereign. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. He reigns in all things. Whether we choose to believe and accept that or not, the God of the universe reigns in all things. It is an amazing thing to consider, beloved, 
that the Lord God of the universe is concerned enough about you and about me, insignificant as we are, that he would, would literally be so concerned that he would have a plan, put that plan into operation, that he would make a world even before the foundation knowing what we would do, and yet putting a plan in place to provide the restoration that we would need through faith in Jesus Christ, God reigns, beloved, and he chose to do these things for your benefit, for mine. What an incredible thing to consider the mind of God. And even in his reigning, beloved, he is all-powerful, and yet he is all-loving. What did Paul say right there at the very beginning? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, how? By the what? Will of God. Nothing occurs beyond the will of God. Amen. Now that's a positive thing to say until you think of the bad times in your life, isn't it? That's a positive thing to say until the world comes to you and says, well, if God is so good, why did he let this happen? If God is so good, why did he do that to me? How do you answer those questions? Well, beloved, I think that we must answer them according to the truth of who God really is. God is in charge. All things occur by the will of God. That means that God can act, as in this case, what does he say? Grace to you, peace from God. Blessed be the God of our Father, of Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We like that part, where God does stuff for us gives us the blessing, gives us the wonderful things that we all want and like and desire to have. Amen. That part we really like. But that means God can act on our behalf and does act on our behalf, as in this case. But what about when God chooses to step back a bit? What happens when God decides to take His hands off? Because you just are going to do what you're going to do like your little two-year-old. Except you're 28. Or 48. Or 58. I don't know what it is after that, so I don't know. Is it still the same as Margaret? Yeah. yeah. See, we're willful. And so when we exert that will and decide we want to do what we want to do, sometimes God just steps back. You ever done that as a parent? You know, you kept trying to train and teach your children so that they don't hurt themselves. In fact, Chad was telling me this morning, he just got this little fence thing around the wood stove for the wintertime because, you know, Brianna's up, she's kind of getting around, and she might touch that stove. She might, you know, inadvertently even fall over or, or get too close to say, put the thing up to protect her. What good is that going to do when she decides to start climbing on that thing and reach over? Unless mom and daddy's there to stop it, she could get hurt. But man is just so willful that we would do that because the things that were withheld from us, somehow we think those are the things we ought to have. Even though they may be made available to us later, even though we must protect and guard and guide, God understands that. But sometimes, you know, you just step back so your kid will learn a lesson. You know, you tell them, don't leave me in the store. <clears throat> don't wander away. And what do they do? Straight to the toy aisle. Can you blame them? Marketers know what to do. Have you ever played the game where <clears throat> you wanted to teach them a lesson? <clears throat> and so you just kind of back up and you let them go. You watch it. I mean, you're not going to let them out your side. But you just let them go. And you kind of hide back here and you just wait. And all of a sudden, about three to five minutes in it, they go. And they start running all over the place and they can't find mom and dad. So you just kind of step back. You want, the, you want the lesson to be solid, don't you? You see, we don't like the fact that God might do the same thing to us. But that's because of our willfulness. But what about when God steps back to see our obedience? Isn't that what happened with Job? Satan comes to God and says, hey, <laughs> this guy, Job, you ought to let me mess with him. And God says, hey, you know, there's nobody like Job down there, buddy. Satan says, that's because you give him everything he wants. You spoil him to death. So God says, you think so? See, God knew Job. See, God from before the foundation of the earth knew what Job was going to say and do and what he was going to choose. Does the fact that God knew that make, make it that God made that happen? No. 
Just because God knows what you're going to do doesn't mean He forces you to do it. God is sovereign in His knowledge. That's what we had to understand that last week. And just because God knows what's going to happen doesn't mean He forces it. It's just like sometimes with my kids. I'll let them get in. I'll let them do things. And I've told them and told them and told them. And I've told them, if you don't do this, and so sometimes it's something that I know won't hurt them too bad, won't be too much of a crisis for them, I'll let them go ahead and do it because that's sometimes the only way they'll learn. Sometimes it is. Now, mamas, I know y'all have a hard time with that. Us guys, us dads, we have an easier time with that. And we just let them do it. And boom, they hurt themselves. And they come whining and crying. They don't come to us because they know better. They go to the, to the woman. They go to the soft one. As uh, we heard from David Jeremiah on our lesson coming here to church today on creation of the woman. That, that word isha means soft. Y'all are the soft ones. The tender ones. The ones that care. The ones that will comfort. The ones that will encourage. Right? Not that daddy won't sometimes. But that's where you go. You know, whenever you see a guys in the locker room, you know, and the TV cameras go in there, which they shouldn't, but they do. And what do the guys all do? Hi, Mom! <laughs> or you get out on the battlefield, and what's the last thing a young boy says when he's dying? Mama. Yeah, God's made us for specific reasons in specific ways, for specific purposes. Amen. So we have this God of the universe, beloved. This one true, living, loving God. And he has set forth a pattern. He has set forth the plan. And so in Job's life, what did he do? He sat back and let Satan work. The testing of your faith, what? The testing of your faith, what? Proves it. So God allowed Job to be tested. And was Job faithful? Yeah. Yes, he was. Do we like that? Yeah, we do. Unless it's us. <laughs> Unless God does that to us. And so in God's sovereignty, beloved, He can do and act on our behalf. In fact, He always does. But He can step back and allow things to occur because He's given man freedom of choice. And so wicked men can prosper, can't they? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the question of the universe? Why do the wicked prosper? They really don't. It may seem that they do. But in the internal scope, in the eternal scope, they don't, beloved. But we serve a God that reigns in omnipotent power with complete and full knowledge. He's everywhere in every moment. So in that store, just like I'm watching my child, He never lets us out of His sight. But as the scriptures teach us, he is the God of love. And as our Baptist faith and message says, all of that is done in the context of his love. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He reigns in those things. But you know what? What did verse 10 say? Verse 10 says, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. You see, God is sovereign over time, beloved, and He's sovereign in His plan and His purpose to redeem man. And in the proper time, the Bible says God sent forth His Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. And so, beloved, God reigns in the administration of all things, but God also reigns over the timing of all things, and He reigns in the power of all things. What does verse 19 say? What is the surpassing greatness of what? Do you see it? Verse 19. His power. Look at the end of that verse. These are in accordance with the works of the strength of His might. God is sovereign in His power, and He reigns in power, beloved. And then look down just a little bit further in verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he looked, raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. God has the power over death. He is the giver of life and he has the power over death. Beloved, the idea of God's sovereignty is not just in this verse. It's not just a New Testament concept. Exodus chapter 15, verse 18. Jot it down. Exodus 15. Verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Yeah, that's the Lord Yahweh. The singular name of the triune God will reign forever. Psalm 47. Psalm 47, verse 8, God reigns over the nations. 
God sits on his holy throne. Psalm 146.10, the Lord will reign forever. Daniel chapter 4 verse 3, how great are God's signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting. His dominion is from generation to generation. Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. 1 Timothy 1, 17, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forevermore. 1 Peter 5, 11, to him be dominion forever and ever, amen. Revelation 19, 6, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. It's all throughout the scriptures, beloved. I don't claim to understand all the dynamics of the intricacies of the Trinity. But this I know, God the Father has set forth the plan and he reigns. And how it is that he can give all authority, as Matthew 20 and 18 declares, to the Son and yet retain authority. How it is that the Holy Spirit of God can work in the authority and the power of God to bring conviction uh, of sin to man and draw them to life eternal. I can't understand all of that. I don't need to understand it. I need to know it. I need to be grateful for it. And I need to live in it. Amen. The clear... An unequivocal point here, my friends, is that God the Father reigns. And just as God has set forth order and leadership in human relationship, so too we see that same order even in His triune relationship with Himself. <laughs> what, Pastor Ken? Yes! There is order in the triune God. Take a look. Go to Corinthians for just a moment. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Scan down, if you will, to chapter uh, 11. Would you look there at verse 3? But I want you to understand, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth there in chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman. Now look, here it is. And God is the head of of Christ, and yet they're one, working, moving, and functioning in perfect unity. A husband and wife who are connected in Christ understand this, and it's incredibly beautiful. It's incredibly wonderful. It is an amazing truth, beloved, that God can exist as one but be three. He can have a order and structure and purpose with each having its specific purpose and call and plan and yet can function together with 100% unity. Contemplate that for a moment, my friend. Contemplate that reality for just... In fact, look at the rest of that passage. I mean... Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman who has had her head shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered. Look, since he is the image and glory of God. Man was made by God from nothing. From the dust of the earth, God created us. But woman was made out of man. Remember what does the Bible say? Took a rib out, made man. I mean, made woman. What does it say here? For man does not, oh, excuse me, let me go back. I was in verse 6, one. I know, verse 7. And man ought not to have his head covered, for he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Does that mean woman's any less than man? No. She's on equal with God. I mean, she can have the same things to save salvation. She can have intelligence. She can do all of these things. But God made man. We are his glory. She is our glory. God made her out of us. That solves the question about the chicken and the egg, doesn't it? Come on, doesn't it? And do you think you can get a man out of a woman? Nope. If there was only woman, we got no hope. Come on, you remember science, right? What are the chromosomes that the woman carries? Come on. 
XX, got my scientist, laboratory scientist back there, XX chromosomes. And what is a female? XX. What is a male? YX. What chromosomes is a male carry? YX. When you put the two together, you can get a YX or an XX. But if you only got an XX, where are you going to get the Y? Man came first, not a woman. We didn't go through evolution. There's no such thing as that. No proof of it anywhere, anyway. It's a religion. You've got to believe it. But just look at the science of it. When God made man, he put both pieces in there. And when he made woman out of the side of man, he only took the one piece that made her the essence of her lovely, soft, sweet, precious, wonderful, incredible self that he's made her. And so even nature, if you want to try to extract God, beloved, even nature screams the truth that you can't. Because if it was only a woman here, she can't generate a man. But since man's got the two chromosomes, I guess if you could take one of his cells and do whatever they're doing with these animals, uh, cloning, you now got the possibility in a man to make a male or a female, but in a woman you can't only make but a female. You can't make both. You're confused, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry. No, it makes sense, doesn't it? No. It's simple science. And yet, because we don't teach it correctly, we don't understand it. And what does it say? A man ought not to have his head covered white. He's the glory of man. The woman is the glory of, uh, excuse me, he's the glory of God. A woman is the glory of man. Look at verse 8. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. That's an interesting question. You might want to go back to Genesis to get some answers for that. However, the Lord neither... Now, look here. This is so important because this is what we get all messed up on. However, the Lord, neither is woman independent of man or man independent of woman. Neither is better than the other. Both are equal in Christ. Both critically important to God's plan. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth now through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? Oops. I didn't just read that, did I? If you say, oh, well, Jesus had long hair. No, he didn't. That's a lie. Show me one Roman leader. Show me one statue from that period of time where the man had long hair. You won't find it. Unless they're doing the Greek thing with the Greek god Zeus and then they put the long hair on him trying to make him a woman. Because you see, we want to make men feminine and we want to make women masculine. We want to turn God upside down. Why? Because of our father. Those of us who don't love Jesus. The devil. It's all there, beloved. You just need to look and read. You need to look at the historical accounts. You need to look at the statutes. You need to look at what was made and what was done. And you will see the realities of the truth. The Bible tells us how to live our lives. It tells us who God is. tells us that He reigns. And we have a choice this morning. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. And the God of the Bible? Because if you do, even in this passage, it's telling you that you're going to be an enmity with the world. Because when you walk up to a man and he's got long hair, you say, well, he's not sure why you're doing that, buddy. But, you know, the Bible says, a uh, man, it's a kind of a shame for him to have long hair. Men aren't supposed to be sissies. And oh, by the way, young lady, uh, y'all be mad at me. Your hair is your glory. Mm -hmm. I better not go any further than that. I'm not in enough trouble as it is. No, you know what? I'm not in trouble. And neither is the Word of God. We either choose to believe it and live it, or we choose something else. And you know what? I don't get to make the choice for you. I have a hard enough time making it for me. Amen. And so, beloved, you take the truth and you walk with it. Well, that's the first point. And if I haven't got myself in trouble now, I guess uh, at 11.58 we probably ought to stop. But you know what? I want you to understand in all those things there, the second point, and I'll leave you with it, and we'll come back next Sunday and look at it. Our God, who is Father, cares. Amen. Look at verse 3. Just look at it. So you can ponder and meditate this during this week. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, what? Who, what? Blessed us. Does that reflect love and care? With every, not some, not most, not a couple, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as He, God, look, chose us, you don't choose somebody you don't love. You don't choose somebody you don't care about. In Him, that's Jesus. 
from before the foundation of the world that we should what? Be holy, be blameless. In what? Love. God cares. That's what we'll pick up next week. Can I ask you, even after what you've heard this morning, do you believe in the Bible? And the God of the Bible? You know what we need to do then? Act like it. We need to act like it. We need to live like it. And when we do, we will experience what you hear me say all the time. A full and a meaningful Christian life. Full in our service for the King. Amen. Our obedience and faithfulness to give of ourselves to the other. And in that finding the most satisfaction and contentment we can ever find. And what? A full and what? Meaningful? What's meaningful? Christian. Only one thing. This is the only thing that has eternal meaning. Amen. And it's as I and you bring the truth of God's word to every person that we meet, then it makes the difference. But we can't bring it, listen to me, until it so permeates our being that every thought and action of our life, every circumstance and situation that we face causes us to think about the Bible. I've had people tell me before, you think all the answers are in the Bible. And I tell them, no, no, I don't. I know they are. I don't just think it. I know they are. Because I've seen it. And because I've seen it, I believe it. Amen. And because I believe it, I want it to impact every aspect of my life. And when I fail, I trust you'll point it out. She'll point it out. I don't want to be anything but who God. Because you can. And you probably will do a better job than I have done if you'll give yourself to Him. For He will take any of us, wherever we are, with whatever we have, which by the way, He gave us anyway, and He will turn us to Himself. <coughs> and He will use us so that we will bring meaning through His truth in our service. <laughs>